Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm uncertain as to who I am speaking at the present. Uh, at present, uh, so I'll also type a comment here just to make sure. Good morning. Um, So let me just quickly make sure that everything is working and in order before I begin. Hi, Johan. Hi. Uh, we can't see your screen share at the moment, so you may just need to turn it off and back on again, please. All right. Thank you so much. Let us see. Hi. <laughs> Morning, Natasha. Oh, the music. There we go. Hello, hello. Okay, I'm going to try and just turn my screen share back on. And let's see. So hopefully everyone can see the screen at the moment, and there should be a little uh, window with my uh, face uh, stuck there on the side. Morning, Musa. It's looking good. Thanks, Johan. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. My name is Johan Tom. I'm the curator for New World Order. Uh, it's my great pleasure then to welcome you all to the first um, walkabout of our uh, exhibition, New World Order. Um, uh, given the, 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 the fact that um, all of this is new to us, please do excuse if there's some small technical difficulties along the way. Fortunately, uh, there's a wonderful team of people behind the scenes here. We'll also try and uh, ensure the smooth flow of uh, the presentation this morning. So yes, uh, I welcome you here from a uh, rather cool Pretoria this morning. Um, but it's my great pleasure to um, take you through this exhibition and the kind of processes and ideas that informed my thinking about curating the show and then to also show you some of the artworks on the show and um, uh, explain to you my own thoughts about it but uh, where possible also to refer to the artist's thoughts about it. So uh, I also just want to say yes for uh, those of you who are unaware of this um, you should be able to ask questions in uh, or make comments in a text-based format. I will keep my eye on that in the chat window so if there's something that you wish to ask uh, please do uh, send a message there. I'm keeping my eye there. Uh, Lauren is also here and she will also do the same so if I miss something uh, please do shout. Um, yes, so I guess uh, this is new territory for everyone involved in the Turbine Art Fair and I can only really speak about my own processes, uh, my own thoughts about doing a virtual fair, the possibilities of, or virtual exhibition as part of a virtual fair, the possibilities and complexity of doing so. And so um, the first thing I think that is important to say about this exhibition is just something about the curatorial premise. Uh, generally, I decided on a rather cheeky title, New World Order. For those of you who do not know, if you go and Google New World Order, you will find every form of conspiracy theory out there on the planet uh, suddenly in your face. Um, most of these concern the way in which the world is supposed to be organized or structured by, I would say, uh, some uh, secretive organizations and so on. So for me, there was something humorous about that, but also something important in thinking uh, about this particular moment and the role that artists have to play in it. Um, so uh, basically the idea is, is that somewhere along the way I thought, well, um, we are experiencing this pandemic as some major kind of shift in our thinking about um, the world in general. I think uh, the thing that happened here questioned um, our personal relationships on an intimate level. I mean, we're still social distancing and so on. It reminded us maybe on, on some level about um, our mortality. Most certainly we, we understand that life is fragile. Um, but then also there was the bigger question with something that affected such a large, uh, well, it, it had global impact. 
and we understand that things will change. Um, what is it that we could find um, in the arts? What kind of plans or ideas about the shifting moment, about its possible outcomes, a possible other future, could be embedded in the work of artists? Um, and of course, from my own perspective, I've been involved in academia now in one way or another for um, 20 years. Um, many of the artists that I admired uh, as a very young artist were all seriously involved in academia. This is long before it became possible to be just a professional artist functioning in the marketplace, for example. Um, and in some way, I still think about academia as being a good space for an artist to be in because it allows for some freedom, uh, freedom of thinking, freedom to experiment, um, and freedom from the constraints of the market in some way. So your work might be commercial, but it need not be in order for you to be a successful artist academic. Now, secondly, there's this idea that artist um, academics are also very much involved, not only in research, as we would define it with an academic environment, um, and, and thinking about their practices, research, um, but also in terms of teaching the young voices that will shape the art world of tomorrow. So, as any artist can tell you, when they make work, uh, each work is the very embodiment of an artist's thoughts about the world, about uh, things that they witness in the world, things they wish to comment upon, but also um, the very issues that they would like to change in the world. Now, um, these, these then take form as an artwork, and typically artists write about these work in academia. But these things are very much ingrained in an artist's personality. And once you start teaching, those kind of concerns cannot but flow over into your teaching philosophy and the way that you engage with students and so forth. So I am very much of the opinion that um, an exhibition like New World Order looks at the work of artists, academics, and that we are trying to trace what kind of vision is of the world, of a new world, of tomorrow, is uh, endemic to that artist practice. So over here, I'm going to uh, begin negotiating, or what do you call it, I'm navigating, there we go, navigating the website now. There's the viewing room. So the first image you see is this uh, banner that keeps zooming in uh, of the exhibition. It's called New World Order. Um, this image itself comes from a map called the Gal Peterson map of the world. The Gal Peterson map uh, is a map that is uh, proportionally correct in relation to um, the land masses uh, and, and, and basically the way the world is structured. So if it looks slightly strange, that's why it's there. Um, I thought, uh, actually, if you look very closely at the banner, you can't see it right there because it's zoomed in. But I like this little bit here where we just see the southern tip of Africa sticking out. So, um, yes, some basic things. Um, over here, there's a small video, which I won't play now. Please do go and look at it, should you feel like it, uh, where I explain my ideas, my initial ideas, in terms of curating uh, the show. Um, as you can see, art surrounds my life. I've been surrounded by artists for much of my life. Um, and many of the artists on this exhibition I've had professional dealings with throughout the years. So it's really nice to be able to take their work and congeal it into a single exhibition. So the works on this exhibition are by artists such as Charlene Kahn from Wits, uh, Johan van der Skei from UCT, Fabian Sapto also UCT, Avi Sufel uh, from UP, Willem Bosov, who's currently at the University of the Free State, is an extraordinary professor. And may I add, also one of the very first artists in this country to get an A rating 
from the NRF for his artist, uh, artistic research. Uh, Diane Victor, whom we all know very well, Jakob from Skulkrake, from Stellenbosch, Gordon Froud, UJ, same with Manette Vari, Fricky Ekstian, UP, Rat Weston from uh, Rhodes University, Resh Machiba, who's a curator and an artist at Wirtz, Kalmash from TUT, Brent Meister, who's currently abroad, but he's been very deeply involved in arts education, and then Jan van Amerwe. So uh, the first thing is, is that this is obviously not an exhaustive uh, list of who is making waves in the world of art, but I was also quite particular in terms of thinking about the artist whose work that I would like to feature on this. And then, of course, um, you know, uh, the brief was sent out to a number of artists and for a variety of reasons, some artists accept and some do not because they simply could not during this time. But I'm very pleased with this selection of artists. Um, someone like Fabian Sapto is predominantly, I would say, a, a process-based artist. So I'm showing two works by Fabian as part of this exhibition. The first is a portrait from the University of Cape Town, ISBN series, it's 2017. It's a print. Uh, the second that I'm just going to open up here a little bit because I think it is a wonderful little artwork um, uh, is this piece called A Thousand Hours of Handling. I think this is a wonderful little work. Um, so there's details that you can navigate on the website here. But of course, once you click view the artwork details, it opens up into another page. So this work in some way is exactly what it says. It is a document of a thousand hours of handling. Between the years of 2013 and 2020, i.e. this current Sorry. moment. Johan, Sorry, we do ha seem to have a frozen sc screen on your side. Oh, shucks. Um, but I am going to open up the viewing room on my side and then navigate as um, as you talk us through, if that's all right. Fantastic. No problem. Thank you. Great. Apologies, mm -hmm. everyone. As I said, we are dealing with this as best as we can. Sorry, while that's loading. Thank you, and I can see that that's there. Can everyone hear me? All fine? <laughs> no, we can hear you. There we go. Fantastic. Yes, yes. There we go. All right. So the Fabian Sapto work is the second one from the top. Uh, no, not actually that one, please, Lauren. Uh, the one below it, it looks like a little bowl. Oops. You know, it's just wonderful that at least there's a team of people helping you. The past couple of months I've been teaching online and then it's just you. So uh, I'm very appreciative for the technical assistance here. All right, so there we go. Uh, currently that window should be opening. So yes, just to return to that piece of work, um, it's literally a small uh, bowl of press stick. And Fabian uh, has been carrying this little ball around with him for seven years now. And he even sent me the documents where he logs each and every minute that he interacts with this little ball of plastic. So um, this is a real record of his life as an artist academic, of someone who is continuously engaged with uh, students, with administration, with artistic research. And um, like he says here, waiting, attending meetings, telephone conversations. So every little moment that he has in between or even during these uh, activities has uh, been recorded materially or physically imbued into the object itself. So like he says there, the time invested in the project is monitored with a stopwatch. It's documented with a photograph or screenshot and noted in an Excel document. I remember when he first sent me this Excel document, uh, I had no idea what I was looking at. But I think it is absolutely wonderful to have such a process-based artwork that in one way speaks about time, 
time is our investment in the world. Um, also, it's something that seems so small and insignificant. And yet, um, when we look at that little ball of plastic now, we understand that it's almost a focused little form um, of energy that we are looking at now. So for me, it's, it's really a wonderful little work, and it's one of the works that I also highlighted initially. Because I think that often when we think about great artistic work, uh, we think about grand visuals or large ideas, but in actual fact, something as small as a little ball of plastic has become a focused point. Uh, it's a globe, much like the Earth. Um, and it's performative. Um, it's sculptural. There's no question about it. So for me, that's really a good little work to start this exhibition with in some way, or this talk as well. So anyway, um, I'm going to move on to uh, another work of art now. My feeling is, uh, please do go and have a look at the other work by Fabian. It's also wonderful. It's a collection of all the ISBN numbers contained in the um, University of Cape Town. He's done a series of those, and I think they're actually quite wonderful. Uh, I want to go over to a second work by Charlene Kahn because I think this work addresses something about um, not only the thematic of the exhibition, but also about those kinds of complexities about putting works uh, online in a virtual format. So when I first spoke to Charlene, um, you know, she was uncertain what it is exactly she wanted to do, even though she'd been working on I Make Art for a very long time. Um, so, uh, Lauren, if you'll just go into that web or into the work itself. I'm sorry, y'all, for some reason my internet has decided now it's slow, exactly now, but uh, I think uh, you should be there. So this is a work in, pro in progress by Khan, um, and it's just a wonderful work for a variety of reasons. For me personally, as a teacher um, of art, I enjoy the fact that the work is presented on this virtual format in its in a multimodal um, uh, kind of fashion, where there's both text, image, uh, uh, artistic statement. Um, and video all coming together to kind of make clear what it is that you as a viewer encounter. Now, in some way, I understand that this exhibition should be, um, this or this work of hers should be exhibited as a large scale installation that you can immediately see there when you look at that small first video, I Make Art, a declarative statement, um, yes, thank you. You can click that play button and mute the sound if you don't mind. So, effectively, uh, Khan went and they modeled a three dimensional space of uh, this artwork in video format. They did this so that the, the, the viewer could get an accurate idea of how these videos may be installed in a real space. So um, what interests me about this is, is that even though we have to deal with a kind of virtual space at the moment, she has really used a, a, a creative thinking to make this work alive, even on a two-dimensional screen. And so um, uh, yes, Lauren, I think you can pause it there. Please do watch the entire video. So we have that one view that would give you a three-dimensional uh, idea of how the work actually functions. But then if you scroll down, um, you also see there's an artist statement. What I love about that artist statement is um, I've actually taken that and made an image out of it in order to keep all the uh, fonts and the changes in uh, lower and uppercase, in order to keep the integrity of that there. Um, because I think often in academia and even in the world of professional art, we want a professional artists uh, or students to give us artist statements. And there's a way, I think, that unfortunately these statements have slowly but surely become more and more descriptive, more social science based, where the statements 
seem to um, become one of the most important ways in which artworks are clarified and explained. But what I like about this statement is, is that it's simply not that. Yeah, the artist's statement is an embodied voice, uh, and, and it's reading through this that one really gets a sense of the kind of emotive intentions inherent in the project uh, for I Make Art. She writes, and I'll just briefly read you, it started off as a reaction to my silencing. An international collaborative project, the German curating leaving Johannesburg, telling me that I didn't need to show uh, my performance video in Berlin because we've already seen all of that. They'd already seen all of that. And look at the change in the font there. Already seen all of that. Feeling that my voice and language were deemed insufficient, I restaged John Baldessari's iconic I Am Making Art from 1976 into a declarative statement. I make contemporary art. Um, I think what's really interesting for me here is, is that this voice avoids all the pitfalls of explaining a work of art to the death. Whilst remaining poetic, um, it is a, a, a defiant voice. Um, and I guess there's that thing about defiance that I was also interested in terms of artistic research generally. I mean, we all know that artists generally do not toe the line. And we have such a wonderful history of political art and resistance art in this country. And so one of my, call it my pet hopes here, was that we would find resistance embodied in these works, uh, a kind of a resistance against this moment, but then also a kind of a hopeful move towards a, a, uh, a resolve, a plan of action. And so with this piece by Khan, if you scroll down, you will see there's a composite view of it. What's wonderful is as you play that video, the voices all uh, replicate on top of one another, and slowly but surely, uh, it becomes a cacophony. I'm being quiet here because uh, hopefully you can all hear that uh, the, the sound from that video. It's always quite unnerving when one speaks online like this without seeing anyone else. <laughs> can you guys hear the sound from the video? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing it. Okay. All right, Lauren, I think you shall have to pause that video there then. Uh, Maranthi says she can't hear it. Uh, I suspect it has something to do with the way in which uh, the, the platform itself is jumping between different windows at the moment. Uh, perhaps my sound is just overriding it. All right. But in that case, I'll ask of you to please look at it. Uh, and and listen to it. What I think is wonderful about this piece of work is despite the fact that uh, Khan starts from this kind of defiance, she's actually also quite clear in terms of her discussions about this work with me is that it's really humorous, it's clumsy, it's bad art in some ways. And I think uh, within academia and education generally, we're so obsessed these days with making good work, with success, that we kind of forget this idea about failure, about the things that we don't get right, the possibilities inherent in uh, that space, where uh, art isn't simply about whether something is technically good, whether it fulfills all of those requirements, but where it's really about a conceptual um, underpinning that is bigger than any single form or single uh, um, performance, a uh, single drawing or so on, that's really about a larger kind of project that even through its failures make visible um, possibilities. Um, so yes, I think in that sense what's really interesting is that uh, this work ultimately becomes humorous and um, Khan is quite clear in terms of her, her, her own position as, as a strong uh, black feminist voice in academia that she feels um, that often people uh, think that this means that she cannot be humorous, for example. 
And yet this work is profoundly humorous. Here, humor becomes something that actually does something. It opens up a critical space for discussion. So I'm just going to go back. We can move out, out of this work. Of course, there's so much to be said about each one of these works on this exhibition that I really cannot talk about them all in depth. Um, there's a wonderful piece by Jan van der Merwe, Pretoria-based sculptor and installation art. We're not going to go into it, but the images are uh, really wonderful. So uh, this piece is just called Downfall, Documents from Heaven. Um, and I guess for him, uh, in his response to my curatorial brief about this kind of post-COVID world that we would live in, um, I think he, <laughs> this is also humorous, even though the work is quite dark. It, it's, it's that kind of question, the downfall, the end of something. And then suddenly there's this uh, moment of these uh, administrative files falling down from heaven. Uh, the end of a system, it, it definitely has this feeling of detritus, turning something, a bureaucracy into detritus. Um, the Rat Western piece is actually a video. Um, and I'm just going to speak shortly about it. I, it's really worthwhile watching that video. It's a beautiful piece of animation uh, combined with found footage and political statements and so on. And as you can see, if you just scroll through the images, uh, please, um, Lauren. Uh, these are video stills from that video. It is such a beautiful short little video. What I liked about um, uh, her a presentation is she sent the work through to me and she said, I can't sell this work. That's not how I work. And I said, but that's absolutely fine. So it's one of the wonderful things about being involved in a special project at an art fair is that, uh, and, and specifically also working with academics is that it gave me um, the ability to work even with artists who aren't interested in selling work necessarily. And so um, ultimately, uh, Rat told me that she she would gladly participate in the exhibition, um, but the work is not for sale. And then if you, um, uh, not now, Lauren, don't worry about doing this, but if you go into the work itself, uh, there's an artist statement, a small video by her at the end of her explanation, where she also talks about the complexity of, um, you can just scroll down a little bit, we don't have to start the video. Thank you. You can see there at the bottom, uh, there she is. She sent me a, a small video where she explains her own practice. She has an opportunity to engage directly with the public, but she also talks about not selling work. What selling work might be mean um, in relation to a video artwork that is meant for distribution on the internet, or for, not distribution, but for display on the internet. So for her, it's nonsensical to actually even think about selling such a video artwork. And I think that's one of the wonderful kind of complexities that uh, suddenly emerge from an online platform uh, because it allows for this idea on the one hand that there's an artwork somewhere in the world that someone can purchase, it can be shipped to them, but also then there are forms of art that happen um, or, or that rely on the very kind of technologies that uh, we are surrounded with, these kind of free or open platform technologies like YouTube, Vimeo, uh, social media and so forth, and and that the the currency of the work, if you want to call it that, really isn't the money. It's not the financial thing. The currency of the work might be the ideas, how it's shared uh, amongst um, groups of people on the internet and so on. And I think we, you know, when social media suddenly became something huge about ten years ago, I don't think we could all really. Um, understand that people would be um, uh, making content almost exclusively for distribution on the internet and, and the kind of monetary um, or even political ideas behind this kind of move towards the virtual. So uh, let us move on just a little bit. Uh, Lauren, please return to the main page. Um, if you scroll down after that, there's a beautiful piece by Johan van der Skyf uh, called Hoekstien um, that I just briefly want to say something about. I think uh, we don't have to even go into that work. I think what's just wonderful is uh, van der Skyf has been a long time lecturer in fine art at UCT. Um, 
That piece hooks in is decidedly simple, but I mean, it's really a piece of sandstone. And if you think about uh, UCT, um, the the building, the Michaelis building and so on, one of the things is this kind of usage of sandstone in academia almost all over the country. And so the question about this cornerstone, this hookstein, this Afrikaans word hookstein, cornerstone, which really is like the thing that anchors it, to, to display it there on its own is to say that this this stone has been removed. And, and we could have a, a real discussion about its value, its archival function, or whether we should discard it, which I think is exactly the kind of thing that uh, Van Escape is commenting on there. We can scroll down, uh, Laurel, uh, Lauren, please. There's four portraits by an artist uh, called Friedrich Ekstien here. Um, they are called The Natural History, Volume 2, page 117, Paint Wrap, and then there's four of them here. Uh, we can't look at them all individually, so let's just uh, go to the very last one. Volume uh, 2, page 120, excuse me, for some reason I'm hiccuping. There we go, it's gone away. And we can zoom into that work. So, Extian is a very interesting artist for me because he is uh, truly a, a fantastic painter. But slowly throughout the years of knowing him, we actually studied together at the University of Pretoria. Now, whew, what would this be? Around mm, about 25 years ago. Um, and I remember him being an excellent painter. What's wonderful about these works is that he's slowly but surely extended his, uh, his painting world into a kind of an exploration through digital technologies as well. So uh, this piece, uh, the Natural History series, um, I'll read a little bit there from the text itself. Let the artist explain the book himself. The Natural History series shows eight figures embedded within pages of text that have been converted into 3D wireframes. The original text is four pages from Pliny the Elders, The Natural History, where he describes unique differences between humans and animals. So, um, Pliny's prescient description of humans is by no means flattering and sadly rings particularly true in our current global predicament as we are uniquely drawn to luxury and excess and unlike other animals prone to ambition, avarice and superstition, in his estimation we are the frailest yet most destructive of beings. So uh, I think what is absolutely amazing about these works on, on the one hand is, is that kind of sense of embeddedness within existing knowledge, the kind of research base of the work itself. But I think technically these things are absolutely extraordinary in terms of their usage of medium, i.e. the three dimensions, uh, uh, the, the, the software, um, the use of color, um, and form. I mean, I, I think that it's really still clear from these prints that Extian really is a painter. And he's a painter who is engaging in new media works, but without letting go of that sense of the painterly, the mark, the mark making. So, um, Extian, I think, rightly identifies this moment showing us as being frail. But then also during this particular moment, I mean, I don't know what it was like for, for everyone uh, here today, but for me it was incredibly traumatic experience, not just the lockdown, but suddenly things like the Black Lives Matter movement. I suddenly felt like every day uh, if I'd opened uh, social media, I, I was uh, involved in some kind of destructive human behavior. Even though these things may be happening anywhere else in the globe, it felt like it impacted on me in a real sense. And, and, um, and it just heightened this, the, the, the kind of violence of this particular moment. So on the one hand, we have nature itself sending us a pandemic, but on the other hand, we are witness to these kind of uh, brutal acts of, of our own making simultaneously. And so I found this a very fitting work to include on this exhibition. I think in many ways, um, that question about us being frail, but also being incredibly destructive is, is perfectly uh, suited to our moment in, in time. 
Anyway, we can move away from those words, please, Lauren. And um, if my website will load, I will continue. Uh, please do, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to just type your comment there. We will ask for some comments at the end of the presentation as well, or questions. Um, there's a beautiful piece by Avi Sufel there um, that really feels to me like a human skin out of wood with these uh, sharp animal teeth uh, protruding out of the back there. Uh, her work is very much focused on the human body and its frailty and so on. Uh, also, a work is focused on, on the question of female agency, and that has become a kind of a, 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 a sub-theme running through this exhibition. Just as a moment here to explain to you, I didn't approach artists and tell them, you have to send me this. I set up a basic brief about the questions of a post-COVID world, about uh, the importance of artist academics, um, and, and their relative freedoms, their, their position in, in relation to artistic practice in South Africa. And I then actually asked for proposals from the artist. And so sometimes we discuss these proposals in depth, uh, took many phone calls and so on. I absolutely hate just sending emails. I think it is, uh, it, it's uh, really problematic if you're trying to deal with artists. You actually have to talk to them and hear what they have to say, hear how they respond, and then kind of move through a process of deciding things together. And slowly but surely through this kind of process of, of discussion, um, I think the local question about violence against women and children uh, and, and the incredible um, frailty, there's that word again, of, of women within our society, the way in which uh, we seem to pay lip service um, to the ongoing brutalization of women's bodies and yet there aren't really any changes. It seemed to me like this was something that slowly but surely started growing uh, as, as a concern for people. This, how could this change apart from this moment? Um, and while there are no real easy answers forthcoming, as you've seen now, okay, so both in Sufal's work, I'm going to jump over that particular little piece there. I'll come back to the Willem Borsov. Uh, please scroll down, Lauren, to the Kalmash, uh, the work by Kalmash, Sorrel. Anyway, it seemed to me that a lot of women artists were talking about this. And, and certainly from my own work as an artist curator, I have actively been exhibiting work about this particular problem. So on the one hand, we have a biological pandemic. And on the other hand, we have, and pardon the pun, a man-made pandemic. Uh, of violence that continues. Even this very morning, we switch on, oh, I look, go and look in the news and, you know, uh, this violence just continues. So um, that work by Cal Mash, uh, she's a rising young star here from TUT. Um, she works a lot, uh, well, she's called herself Kalmash for a reason. She's very much invested in, in the idea of cattle. I, I think anyone who's from a South African context can immediately understand the importance of cattle within a local South African context. But also in Kalmash's work, um, there's this question about the woman's body as a, as a, as something that can be owned, as a piece of property that can be sold. Um, or that is not human. Um, so she writes here, how it feels to be a black woman. So many generations of oppression, continued oppression that we continue to fight against and yet we are still in the slaughterhouse. On Soro, the title of the world means, uh, the title of the work, Soro means cruel or violent in Sepedi. This world is capable of being extremely cruel. The pandemic has surfaced the cruelty that has existed all along. From Black Lives Matter, gender-based violence, to fear of the unknown world, we will come uh, We will come out to when the crawls are reopened. So she writes, the artwork presents a figure on her knees. This can be signed as a sign, uh, this can be seen as a sign of defeat, to fall on your knees and surrender. But, and this is the crucial bit, 
uh, this was very important for me in all of these works, is that we couldn't simply just highlight society's ills because it seemed to me that that would make of artists critics only. And I'm not interested in artists who are only critics. Artists must have plans for the future. They must have some kind of optimistic hope that what they do will change things, not simply by giving it form, but, but by virtue of the very thinking that goes on behind it. She writes, um, being on your knees can represent hope. In this artwork, the face of the figure is hidden in the camouflage black triangles that represent an hourglass, symbolizing that hope can be abstract during the 2020 global pandemic. Being on your knees can also show strength, spiritual strength, I presume she means praying, in which case this would be a gathering of hope. If one is able to pray, there is still hope. There's a wonderful, a wonderful animated little video where Kalmash uh, talks about herself and her own work, and I urge you all to watch it. Um, so I want to go out of this work. Um, sorry, my internet slow here, Lauren. Um, and then quickly also just refer you to other works uh, that may uh, or, or that are related to this thematic. So um, just quickly uh, an overview. So I've included three works by uh, Resh Machiba, the artist uh, from, well, she works as a curator at WITS. Um, and these works are from the Kali series. I like these works because they were about a kind of a resistance uh, or resistant feminine figure. So um, I, I find them very, very interesting because on the one hand, they, they're so dark that one, I'm Kali, I'm black. It's resolute in her statement of who she is. Um, she looks straight, what she calls an oppositional gaze. She faces the camera. There's no escaping from this figure. The figure is one that, um, that will not yield. And then simultaneously, when we look at the two smaller images right under it, sorry, Lauren, I'm not sure if I'm going to fast view there. Um, those two child Kali images. I saw these images when was it two years ago at the Potsdam National Arts Festival, where she'd exhibited them as part of a show that uh, Aisha Waja had curated, and I fell in love with these images. The child Kali images for me, in some way, are so deeply unsettling that they, they bother me still now, every time I look at them. Um, so there's something so fantastically uncertain about that girl child thing. She has all this potential, uh, but she's deeply vulnerable. Uh, she, she is as yet undefined and yet simultaneously, um, this moment will not last. Uh, she will grow up. And I think on the second image, that distortion of the face, the, the second one, the child Kali 2, it's also deeply unsettling for me because, again, there's this possibility in, embodied in this child there of becoming something more than merely just another female Oh, shucks, and there goes my alarm. Fortunately, someone else is around here. Yeah? Okay. So, um, I think it's that sense, that sense of uncertainty that catches me for the most part with this work. It's really, um, it is hopeful, but it's uncertain. And especially in this country, again, you know, there's a there's a real need here for for kind of a hopeful uncertainty, even though what comes out of that may not conform to our expectations. Um, the women of tomorrow may not just be simply good little girls who follow the rules, and we as a society have to. Be ready and willing to accept that as an outcome, um, but also to celebrate, to look forward to a time when women um, can express themselves more freely and more openly, 
and and be something else than merely our stereotypical visions of what they should be. Um, so yes, everything is. Oh, I'm sorry, you know, with this freaking alarm. Living living in South Africa, you see right there. While we're doing this presentation, the alarm system goes off, and this is we are so used to this kind of fear. I know uh, many of my students when I speak to them, you know, this is a real problem for them to just be out in public and and to walk um, around. If you don't have a car, you become a target so easily. And, and yet we live with this kind of paranoia. It is, in some strange way, it is our new normal already. So let's just move out of that work, please. And then I want to talk specifically um, about, we're running out of time. So um, I just want to quickly go to the Diane Victor piece. So this work for me is really, it's very close to my heart. It's called The 14 Stations. Uh, Lauren, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, you can sit there. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So in 2018, I was a curator for the Potsdam National Arts Festival. I'd nominated Diane Victor as being the festival artist. She came and she put up a large exhibition consisting of prints and so forth. Um, but then she was very specific in terms of she wanted to make a installation artwork. Um, and, uh, you know, Victor, I think she's one of the strongest voices in terms of, of critique of our society generally. She doesn't pull her punches and so on. Um, but also, I think, whereas we know Victor quite well for her prints and drawings in South Africa, the truth of the matter is, is that um, I always find that she's at her best when she's making larger projects without those kind of commercial prerogatives. So it was very interesting for me when she ended up proposing a large scale installation um, consisting out of uh, projections um, that she would ultimately make by drawing with smoke on uh, glass and then putting a light source behind them. So the work itself, uh, this 14 station was a site specific installation and we have yet to find a second space to um, exhibit the work. But then fantastically, we suddenly have this opportunity through the Turbine Art Fair to put the work um, up as part of this exhibition. And then just on a basic side note, this also again shows you how artists have had to adapt because in order to be able to show such an installation on this platform, we had to already have good video documentation of this work, good photographic documentation. And um, this was just one of those things that we were aware of even when we set up this installation in 2018. So um, when you look at that, uh, you'll see it's the 14 stations. It's an installation, smoke and glass, steel and mixed medium. Um, this is the kind of work I really think our National Museum should be investing in, and yet I'm not sure if anyone has any money left after all of this. Uh, not that uh, I think that Victor would necessarily have to sell the work for a lot of money, but it's the kind of work that needs to be shown again and again. So um, I've written a short text with uh, Victor about this work, and really what you are looking at with this work is uh, a, a, a work that comments on femicide in South Africa. So I'm going to ask Lauren um, if you can just scroll down to the second video called Diane Victor, the 14 stations, documentation of installation, and play that. So you won't be able to hear the sound from that, but the sound really is not necessary. Effectively, um, what you are witnessing is a kind of a pilgrimage of sorts. It's based on the Roman Catholic uh, ritual of the 14 stations, where you would stop at 14 images of Christ's suffering and meditate on the nature of suffering and lust. However, in relation to this work, these images are replaced by portraits on smoke of women who had been murdered by their partners. Um, these images were found in mainstream media uh, in South Africa. And um, 
and then transferred to, uh, well, representations, if you like. I'm sorry. Anyway, apologies for that. Um, so she installed these 14 images uh, in a place known as the Any Bingle uh, uh, Student Center. But we just found that kind of brutalist architecture, uh, that kind of masculine brutalist architecture as being a, a perfect kind of um, foil to these absolutely ethereal ghostly images of these uh, women who had passed on. And so I can tell you without reserve that it was a harrowing experience to walk uh, these 14 stations and to see all these images um, kind of just floating in this rough, hard, um, masculine space. Once you reach the top, and Lauren, you can just scroll up to the top uh, of the page, please. And on the left there, you'll find details of images. So once you reach the top, and you look down, um, there was a large scale drawing that Victor had made on the floor uh, in fly ash. And these, uh, this drawing uh, was of a, a woman and a partner holding each other. Um, and of course, fly ash is poisonous, but the drawing itself filled the entire space with, uh, with this kind of acidic smell and so on, this kind of toxic environment. And so, um, for me, I really wanted to show this work again, um, but also this kind of platform where serious works can be shown um, uh, without necessarily being concerned about monetary um, uh, uh, questions. I think this was a good moment for me to include a, a kind of a serious academic work, if you want, um, into the space of an exhibition as well. So. Um, I want to finish with that particular work, but I also want to ask you to please do go and look at all of the works on the exhibition. I think uh, each each of these works really is the result of an artist's uh, serious engagement with thinking um, and being a South African human being, but one who is also deeply engaged with a possible future. I mean, we have fantastic works by Willem Bosov. Um, the Brent Maestri work is absolutely delightful because he has created a um, complete persona that only lives on the internet. Uh, he calls this uh, figure willpower. And, and willpower is really, in so many ways, he's a bad artist. He makes bad music and he publishes it uh, all over the internet. And, and he makes. Uh, he really tries very hard to be a successful artist. And and yet it's in that kind of trying, I think, that there's something completely uh, human that emerges from the enterprise. So um, I hope that, uh, yes, uh, I, I hope that this has been interesting for you. Um, but many of the works are very humorous and I've shown quite serious works now, um, but I think even as I said, with a, with a, a Charlene Kahn piece, that's, it's just wonderfully humorful, the Willem Borsov pieces similarly. Um, and so I'd like to know if there's any kind of questions from you. You can see right there at the bottom, there's a little write-up about the exhibition itself um, that you are welcome to read. And yes, I think we have very little time for some talks, but if there's a question or something, please do ask. It's a pleasure. Uh, I see on the comments there. It's a pleasure, Cara. Any questions or comments? Well, I've seen some comments. Are we okay? No questions? Well, in that case, I really do want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, for this uh, brief walkabout through the exhibition. Um, as you can see, there's a lot to be said about the various artworks on this show. And it was something that I felt really strongly about in the sense that I didn't just want to show uh, beautiful works. I wanted to show works with layers of depth and that you could excavate 
for a variety of meanings and uh, interpretations. And as I say, lastly, for that kind of hopeful eye towards a future that we must all have. So uh, with that in, in uh, with that said, I do wish you all a wonderful weekend and thank you very much. Thank you.